We begin our live stream this evening. It's Tuesday, it's 29th of January. And my name, for those who don't know me already, is Brother Sean. And I'm a member of the Teo community of St. Francis. But before we do anything, as this vigil is dedicated to Gaia, our beloved Earth Mother, I would like first to light a candle for peace, for peace in the hearts of all God's children, for peace in the hearts of all our brothers and sisters in the Teo community of St. Francis around the world, and for all the members of our Heart to Soul Prayer Partners for Peace, our social media site. So I dedicate this light as a symbol of love and I call on the Father, Mother, God in the presence of Kuan Yin, Magdalena, Mother Mary, Gaia and Isis, in the presence of the company of heaven. I call on all the Ascended Masters to be with each one of us this evening as we gather here and to bring the whole family of God, all faiths and none who worship the one loving God by a different name, but they are in essence and truth our brothers and sisters. And many this evening I know are hurting in mind, in body and spirit. Many are homeless, many are hungry, Many are living on the poverty breadline. Many are in the depths of despair. And we pray especially for the families, the young women and children. There's 50,000 of them in Tent City, in Damascus, in Jordan. And the cold weather has come and many are struggling. So let us pray for them and for peace for peace around the world, for peace within the heart of every child of God. And we pray for Jerusalem, the heart chakra of the world and the birthplace of the three major world religions, Jew, Muslim and Christian, and that they can come together and put aside their woundedness and their historical indifferences. Let us pray for peace. May there be peace among us. May there be peace on earth. <coughs> and as we gather, dear friends, let us just hold the love, the love of the Supreme for each child of God. And in the stillness and the silence, let us allow that peace touch us and fill us with love. And for my contribution this evening, for Brother Rob, I would like us to look at a continuation of the wonderful book by Matthew Fox on the coming of the Cosmic Christ. But in this section to look at from the quest for the historical Jesus to the quest of the Cosmic Christ a paradigm shift for Western religion. But first we have some quotes, some lovely wise sayings, and I'd love to share them with you. And this is from Colossians 1 verse 16. In him were created all things in heaven and on earth, everything visible and everything invisible. And from Gregory of Nazianzus, Christ exists in all things 
that are. And from Clement of Alexandria, the Logos of God has become human so that you might learn from a human being how a human being may become divine. And Hildegard of Bingen has this to say, it is God whom human beings know in every creature. I've got to read that again. It is God whom human beings know in every creature. And the great Thomas Aquinas, the Dominican, he says each creature is a witness to God's power and omnipotence and its beauty is a witness to divine wisdom. Every creature participates in some way in the likeness of the divine essence. The incarnation accomplished the following, that God became human and that humans became God and sharers in the divine nature. Isn't that beautiful? And Mechild of Maldeburg says, each of us is a mirror of eternal contemplation with a reflection that must surely be that of the living Son of God with all his works. And Meister Eckhart says, God is constantly speaking only one thing. God's speaking is one thing. In this one utterance, God speaks the Son and at the same time the Holy Spirit and all creatures. And the wonderful Julian of Norwich says, See, I am God. See, I am in everything. See, I never lift my hands of my works, nor will I ever. See, I lead everything toward the purpose for which I ordained it, without beginning by the same power, wisdom and love by which I created it. How could anything be amiss? And Nicholas of Cusa says, Divinity is the enfolding and unfolding of everything that is. Divinity is in all things in such a way that all things are in divinity. And Jaroslav Pelikan says the Enlightenment's quest of the historical Jesus was made possible and made necessary when Enlightenment philosophy disposed the cosmic Christ. Sorry, deposed the cosmic Christ. And Christa Stendhal says, Our age and that age of the first century have more in common than we think. Both times can be characterized as cosmically scared, frightened ages, caught under principalities and powers where tiny little human beings just know that they cannot do much, that they are not in control, that they are just caught. And there's another quote from Thomas Kuhn. <coughs> Forgive me. The reception of a new paradigm often necessitates a, re a redefinition of the corresponding science. Some old problems 
may be re relegated to another science or declared entirely unscientific. Others that were previously non-existent or trivial may, with a new paradigm, become the very archetypes of significant scientific achievement. And Jesus has this to say, people do not put new wine into old wineskins. If they do, the skins burst. The wine runs out and the skims are lost. No, they put new wine into fresh skins and both are preserved. And lastly, there's a beautiful quote from Thierry de Chardin who says, This third nature of Christ, neither human nor divine, but cosmic, has not noticeably attracted the explicit attention of the faithful or of theologians. Now that is profound, isn't it? That is such a profound statement that neither the faithful nor the theologians nor the church nor religion have comprehended the true essence of the cosmic Christ. And Matthew says this, a few years ago I referred to the term the cosmic Christ in a television show being taped under the direction of a Methodist minister. She asked, what is the cosmic Christ? I've never heard the phrase before. This woman was a well-read and recently educated minister, having been ordained about five years. I have since learned that very few graduates of Christian seminaries, Protestant or Catholic, have been exposed to the theology of the cosmic Christ. Now that's challenging. Theologian and scientist Thierry de Chardin complained that he could not find either theologians or lay people interested in the cosmic Christ. Why is this concept so foreign to Christianity today? Lutheran scholar of church history Jaroslav Pelikan believes it is the result of the Enlightenment Enlightenment philosophy deposed the cosmic Christ, he writes. One might expect that when rationalism and above all cosmology, the cosmic Christ would be banished as well. If humanity can survive without a cosmology, why would it need a cosmic Christ? Good point. If the human mind has outgrown mysticism, why would it need a cosmic Christ? In an anthropocentric era of culture, education and religion, there is no need of a cosmic Christ. Such a concept is an embarrassment. If Newton is to correct and our universe is essentially a machine, who needs a cosmic Christ? There is no mystery in machine universe. The concept of mystery as the dark silence behind all being and the deep, unfathomable presence that grounds all beings is banished. The enlightenment banished mystery and mysticism relegating the latter to extraordinary states of consciousness on the periphery of things and consequently it banished the cosmic Christ. How tragic! As Lutheran scholar Joseph Sittler observed, the rationalism and pietism that infiltrated Christianity from the 17th century 
to the present also turn down the blaze of the vision of the cosmic Christ so radically that it was effective only as a moral or mystical incandescence. We see in this brief account of the loss of a cosmic Christ theology the power of culture. In this case the Enlightenment movement to influence spirituality. The Christian West was too alienated from its own creation mystical tradition to resist this secular effort to eliminate a living cosmology symbolized religiously by the cosmic Christ. Augustine's theology, which heavily influenced the philosophy of Descartes, has no cosmic Christ. Augustine's preoccupation with human guilt and salvation and his promotion of an introspective conscience offered no resistance to a cultural movement that sought to eliminate the cosmos, the maternal principle in the psyche, and with it the cosmic Christ. How tragic! In effect, theologians responded to the Enlightenment by putting aside the concept of the cosmic Christ and with it most other attempts to see the world and faith in non-anthropocentric ways. As white Western culture decimated native populations by acts of colonialism, populations that worshipped a cosmic Christ because they worshipped in a living cosmology, the Western Church lost its cosmic Christ. Theologian Christer Stendhal wisely criticizes Rudolf Bultmann for his anthropocentrism and indeed the entire theological enterprise of our time. Heavy stuff. But this is what he's, his quote is saying. We Christians happen to be more interested in ourselves than in God or in the fate in his creation, sorry, of his creation. Rudolf Bultmann's whole theological enterprise has one great mistake from which all others emanate. He takes for granted that basically the center of gravity, the center from which all interpretation springs, is anthropology the doctrine of man. Instead of the cosmic Christ, the Enlightenment challenged Christian theology to go in search of the historical Jesus. The quest for the historical Jesus has dominated Christological studies for two centuries. Pelican commenting on how this quest has been undertaken at the expense of the cosmic Christ says the enlightenment quest for the historic of the historical Jesus was made possible and made necessary after enlightenment philosophy deposed the cosmic Christ what an amazing piece of work is that I hope I haven't baffled you all with science, but it's just amazing. It's truly amazing to feel the power and presence of God. It's truly amazing to sense that the Spirit of God today <clears throat> has reawakened within an oppressed, suppressed church a Western civilization who was more focused on the self, the self, and not in a cosmology that embraced the cosmic Christ. So let us just reflect. 
let us just reflect. Let us come to this place. Let us be still. We have read sufficiently for this evening. Let us engage our hearts with the Cosmic Christ. Let us come to the Cosmic Christ. Let us ask the Cosmic Christ, what are you saying to me? What makes sense that I have heard this evening? What is it saying to my heart? What is the Cosmic Christ saying to your heart now? It's important. It's important for you and I to understand that the Father, Mother, God doesn't use big words. Man uses big words to impress and we've certainly read a lot of big words there. I struggled with some of them. But it would appear, it would appear that the spiritual men of the day who were considered holy, educated, scholarly, were more preoccupied about themselves, the self, than they were about embracing the true cosmic Christ. And there we have, and there we have a sadness a sadness that has been perpetuated down through the centuries where the ordinary man, woman and child the creation of God, the child of God has been denied access to the cosmic Christ. So who is the cosmic Christ? Maybe some of you have just joined us and you're thinking, my God, this man in front of the camera is talking above my head. I don't understand a word of it. He's like a parrot. Maybe I am. So I'd like to put a question to you. What do you perceive the cosmic Christ to be? Who is this cosmic Christ? Who is the Cosmic Christ? I would love you to answer that in your heart. Come to this from your heart because your heart is your teacher and yet what is so tragic, many are afraid to connect with their heart today. They're afraid, afraid. They can't cope with silence. I listened to an interview recently and I was dumbfounded. On the panel, there was a person there who said that they cannot live without crises. Oh, they have to have the television on in every room. The radio must be on full blast. They want loads of people and noisy children 24-7. And I was getting a headache just listening to them, thinking, are you deranged? Even when they're asleep, they put on their headset and they have heavy metal music blasting through their eardrums. Why? Because they said they're scared of the silence. They're scared of having to face their reality. What is that saying to you? I have a dear friend, excuse me, I've got a niche. I've got a dear friend. And when I used to go and see her up until a few years ago, the radio was on full blast. Or it was the television or the music center. You'd sit there and try and have a conversation and you'd be talking over the television set or over the radio or over the music that she was playing and it was so loud. 
and I was going hoarse. And I put up with this for a few months and then I went back. Oh no, she said, why don't you come and see me? And I said, because I'm hoarse. What do you mean you're hoarse? I said, I'm, I'm hoarse in my throat because I'm having to shout at you. Well, I don't hear you. I said, you don't hear me because you never switch the television or the radio or the music player off. What do you mean I don't switch them off? I have them on all the time. But isn't it rude to have them on when people call? Well, they get used to it, don't they? I said, well, I'm not used to it. In fact, I find it a burden because it hurts to have to shout at someone you love and they don't even hear you so you decide what you're going to do and when you do let me know and then we'll hopefully come and see you. A year later I heard from them and to say was I okay was I coming to see them and I said I'd love to come and see them so I said what's the situation with the television the radio and them she said oh I still play them I said oh well then we best just have a chat on the phone. But what is it about mankind that's afraid to sit in their chair in silence? Why are they afraid to connect with their reality? What is it within the psyche of every man and woman who have this paranoia of silence and listening to the heart? It's so tragic. I remember when I had the retreat house in North Wales when I was working full-time night duty to fund this re little retreat house for nurses and nuns who were burning out in their ministry on the front line of nursing care. And I had one particular nun who was lovely and she came from inner London where it was noisy with fire sirens, police sirens, helicopters. Oh. She came, it took her three days to settle into the quiet in Clandidno where I lived for 10 years. It took her three days. She was having withdrawals. She couldn't cope with without the sounds of the sirens, the fire alarms, the police alarms, even the helicopters and the aircraft flying over so low it was deafening. But they'd become acclimatized. So I'm coming back to the question, who is the cosmic Christ for you? Who really is the cosmic Christ? And why do you feel or sense in your being that now is the paradigm shift? Empowering ordinary men and women where religions and the established intelligentsia within religious religions have refused to acknowledge the cosmology of Jesus. Why do you think ordinary men and women are excited, attracted and drawn to the cosmology of the cosmic Christ? Reflect on it. Just come into your heart for a moment if you would and let us reflect why do you think that the co cosmic Christ is so appealing to the ordinary person today? What is the magic formula that draws ordinary men and women like you and me to the cosmic Christ? Let's reflect on it. Let's reflect and see and feel and sense our heart speaking to us about the cosmic Christ. We must listen to our heart for in the heart there is the truth.